It's indeed a presidential intervention in the politics of the 10th National Assembly as President Tunubu today meets again with members elect ahead of the inauguration next week. Governor Wike, former Governor Wike, Autumn Uguayi, and Ekpazu, and Governor Shei Makine of Oyose, the G5 group, had continued their meetings with President Bola Tinobu. They had a conversation today, and after the meeting, they said it's towards fairness and justice. Hello everyone, it's good to have you join us again on the program tonight. This is Politics Today live on Channels Television. I'm Sean Joaquin Balloway. Let me take you like an Uber driver through this one hour ride. And I hope that it's not going to be bumpy, but very educative and very and, uh, enlightening. So tonight, get along with me everyone and let's get started. So much to talk about. The President, Balatunobu. Uh, has been having several meetings and part of the meeting is with the G5 governors, you know them, of the five states. Uh, former governor of uh, Rivers, Eugene Samwike, former governor of uh, Benue and Enugu State, uh, Otom Uguayi, and former governor of Abia State, Okeze Ekpazu, and the governor of uh, uh, your State, Governor Sheyi Makinde. Their meeting, they say, is to us justice and fairness. We'll be giving you insight into what they said after that meeting and also the meeting with President Bola Tinubu with members elect ahead of the inauguration. What does this mean? Where would the pendulum swing? Some people we understand are not attending that meeting. A lot to talk about on the state of the nation, the state of the APC and the National Assembly leadership politics. Stick around with me, everyone. But first, let's serve you with some of your political roundup stories. President Bola Tinubu today met with two governors of Akwa Ibom and Plateau State, Mr. Umo Eno and Caleb Muftuang at State House in Abuja. Speaking to correspondents after the meeting with the president, Governor Eno said that with the elections over, it is time to defocus on politics and dwell on the business of governance. Ahead of the June 13 inauguration of the 10th National Assembly, members elect of the House of Representatives from the Northwest Geopolitical Zone have endorsed Tajuddin Abbas and Benjamin Carlo as the Speaker and Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. The group comprising of 74 members out of the 92 members elect from the seven states of the Northwest at a meeting in Abuja said they have accepted the All Progressive Congress zoning formula for the 10th Assembly leadership positions in favor of Abbas and Carlo and urge others vying for the position to step down for the choice of the party. The Nigeria Social Society Situation Room says the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, must apologize over the conduct of the 2023 general elections. Speaking during the presentation of the final report on the elections, the convener, Mrs. NLB, maintains that the election was marred by irregularities, especially as it concerns the technological inputs, which was a highlight as allowed by the Electoral Act of 2022. However, a dissenting voice from the group cautioned the convener to be circumspect in making demands that stem out of personal interest rather than that of the group. A faction of the Nasrawa State House of Assembly led by Ibrahim Balarabe has held a plenary session and approved the state governor's request for the appointment of 20 special advisors. During the plenary, the only female lawmaker of the 7th Assembly, Hajirat Dayanyaru, was sworn in and the speaker also named the principal officers of the group of lawmakers. Following the approval of Governor Abdullah Isuli for the renovation of the assembly complex, Mr. Balarabe announced a break of legislative duties to resume on July the 10th to enable the renovation work to Immense. Meanwhile, a group known as the Nasrawa Coalition for Justice, made up of mostly aged women wearing black attire, staged a protest in front of the assembly complex in Lafia and are protesting the factional speakership of the 7th Nasrawa State House of Assembly. They're calling for the process to be followed without interference from any quarters over the principal officers of the 7th Assembly. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us on the program. Let's begin by letting you know what has been happening at the presidential villa in Abuja. It's been a behive of activities. 
as uh, the president in the second week is been receiving a lot of visitors now some faces are now going back some some of them have been back two or three times in the last one or two weeks so one of them is a former governor of River State, in some Wike, alongside some of his friends within the G5, or what they refer to as the Integrity Group. In the attendance at a meeting, uh, the members of that group, Governor Shei Makini of your State, former governors in some Wike of Rivers, former governor uh, of Benue, Samuel Autumn, Okeze Kwazu of Abia, and Ifanyi Ogwanyi of Enugu State. They met with the president, and they said... Their intent is to seek fairness and justice. National building is uh, a very uh, difficult task. Uh, you have to uh, keep evaluating, you know, what, what you are doing, where you are going, and uh, so we have to uh, keep. Uh, uh, seeing the president, you know, to let him know what is uh, happening. And for this evening, uh, the G5, uh, the integrity group, you know, uh, uh, we also came to let the president know what we stood for. Fairness, justice, and equity. And we have not changed. We're not the only visitors who called Ala Villa today. The governor of uh, Aquaibom State, uh, uh, Governor uh, Umo, you know, also called, but I mean, which we showed you earlier on the political roundup. But the governor of Enugu State, Mr. Peter Umba, also met with the president. And this was what he said after the meeting. He's concerned about the security and the issue of peace in the East Zone State and the Southeast region. Take a listen to him. You know that the Southeast has uh, made a collective demand to have Namdekano released. And we basically identified with that and request Mr. President, who in his inaugural address promised the people that he's going to engender national healing and is going to serve with compassion. So we've basically informed him that this would serve as a pointer to his administration's uh, extension of hands of fellowship to Ndibu. All right, then let's tell you some of the other activities that have happened today at a presidential villa. President Balatunobu assigned his very first bill into law. The president uh, today exercised his powers uh, as uh, enshrined in the constitution by assenting to the bill, passing to him from the Ninth National Assembly uh, for a uniformity in a retirement age of judicial officers. The president uh, signed into law the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, fifth alteration number 37, 2023, was presented by the outgoing Ninth National Assembly. With the signing of the Constitutional Amendment Bill, Retirement, age, and pension rights of judicial officers have been effectively brought into uniformity and other related matters. While signing the amendment bill into law, President Tinubu pledged his administration's dedication to strengthening the judiciary, ensuring the rule of law, and empowering judicial officers to execute their responsibilities effectively. So one of the other meetings that happened today was at a banquet, or it was a large house from what we see. It's a meeting of President Tunubu with uh, members-elect for the 10th National Assembly. This is in his own uh, role as uh, the leader of the party, APC, uh, that will be the ruling party in the 10th National Assembly, in both chambers of the National Assembly, and is asking for their support for the endorsed and the favorite candidates of the party for the presiding officer's role. Let me allow you to listen to some of those who are at that meeting. I believe the sky is a limit in terms of where we want to take our people who we represent in terms of government of Nigeria. And you will all agree with me that we are at a point at a very low end in our country. 
at a point where we need to start doing things differently. At the point where the next four years will either make or mark development in our country. I spoke about tribe, how we should not focus on that. But that we should recognize that we are a secular state. And we cannot talk about national cohesion, national unity while ignoring the secularity of our nation. Therefore, every step taken in the formation of the government architecture for the next dispensation must incorporate these elements. So you heard the chief of, well, he will soon become the chief of staff to the president, uh, Honorable Femba Jabiemela, the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the Ninth Assembly, and the favorite for the Deputy Speakership or position uh, for the Tenth National Assembly, Honorable Ben Kalu, who is the spokesperson of the Ninth National Assembly in, this, in the Green Chambers. Let's get a perspective and let's know uh, what really went down. I have one of the members elect who was at the meeting, is a seven member of the House of Representatives from River State, a member of the PDP, Honorable Solomon Bob. He joins us live here in our studio. Thank you so much, Honorable, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Sean. My pleasure to be here. So you were at the villa today? Yes, I was. You met with the president? Yes, I did. So how, how did that go? Um, well, I think it's an opportune time for me to see uh, my um, um, take about what went down today. Um, I, you know, I'm not in the business of singing or, you know, high... Um, um, how do you say, um, high service. But today I watched a president who showed competence. You know, I was really inspired by his speech. I watched perhaps the most um, exhilarating or inspiring speech by a Nigerian president since I came of age watching politics. You know, he covered all the matters or every field. He, I mean, the entire field. He spoke about uh, unity. He spoke about... Um, uh, politics being over and not to focus on governance, and the speech was extempore. He had no paper in his hand. No paper. No paper. No prompter. It was off the cuff. Nothing. It was. It was quite inspiring. The performance by the, by the president. I was really inspired. But this was a closed door meeting. The press had been asked to go out. I have, at that time, yeah, the press had been asked to leave. But um, everybody who was there, you know, um, had a positive take about what happened. He spoke, um, you know, with authority, you know, authority and a lot of confidence. Showed confidence. As an opposition lawmaker, yep. uh, was he able to convince you, for you to see reason why, as an opposition lawmaker, you should align with the ruling party's um, stance on the leadership? Well, let me just say this. Um, I think there's a lot of um, mistake, and people deliberately uh, go into misconstruction about um, the role of uh, opposition lawmakers um, is regarding the uh, choice of um, leadership of um, the chambers. Now, um, we are not the ruling party. I belong in the position. Our job is not to select or nominate or decide you know, who, who should preside. That is not my sign of politics or parliamentary practice all over the world. And this is the rule of thumb. Is, 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 in, is it in the standing rule of the House? Yes, uh, the standing rule is that we are all on, that, on the day we are going to vote. Uh, may, uh, you are, that's also section 50 of the constitution. We're all going to vote. But the ruling party has the prerogative, the privilege. By convention, by convention, not by any law. By convention, by rule of thumb. This is best global practice. If you watch the last uh, US election for House speakership, um, where Kevin McCarthy emerged, it was entirely a one person thing. The 12 round of votes, 15 round of votes, it was entirely McCarthy running against himself. He had the back of his party. He had the back of uh, five party. times. He, I mean, they went times. back and forth. I think 15 times or thereabouts. Yeah. yeah. All this was about, about McCarthy running against himself. Uh, the party had made a choice. The only problem was the Freedom Caucus of uh, the GOP wanted to extract commitment from McCarthy regarding some. Uh, his state party wasn't conservative enough. When they made the those commitments were made, uh, were met, that was it. The deal was done. So it's essentially the prerogative or the privilege of the party that has the numbers, that is the majority in the House, or whatever, I mean, I mean in House, now I use it, both House, House and Senate, mm. to nominate. People say the zone to a person, that's a wrong interpretation or a wrong use of words. 
nominated person, and they have a right, they have a choice to do that. It is their it is standard practice for you to, no, I mean, all over the world, that's how it is. I said rule of thumb, or best parliamentary practice, that's how it is, that's how it is. There's so no the ruling party decide on who they want? Absolutely, absolutely. You see, we make um, a, a lot Just of... Just like we saw in Pelosi, in the democratic... Let me tell you, let me just tell you, part of this, what I'm appealing with this country is that we have a lot of dysfunction in the way we interpret things and the way we view things. We are too primordial and too... Um, we ride on the crest of emotion to, um, you know, misconstruct things and then, uh, you know, spin them on the basis of tribe, religion, and so on. If we, had any, we, we, if we were not a country that's riddled with dysfunction, Speaker Femi will still be Speaker today. It doesn't matter where the president comes from. In Ghana, for instance, what, happened, what has happened to um, you know, our new quest now for a new Speaker, you know, wouldn't happen in, in that country. If this was Ghana, for instance, don't go too far away, I'll give you an example next door. If this was Ghana, um, Femi will still be Speaker today, I can assure you, because there are two different uh, arms of government. And one election does not have any consequence for the other one. Okay? It will not have any consequence. But, but here, when somebody wins an election, but, 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 but Honorable, our yeah. country is slightly different. Uh, in different. some ways, uh, you, you see the, the manner in which we have traveled, uh, and I mean, from the Civil War period up until now, we have not fully recovered from the, some of the issues that have bound us and sometimes divide us. Issues of religion, issues of ethnicity, it's too difficult for us to dissect away from who we are as a people. So you imagine that uh, as largely divided Nigeria is along a religious and ethnic line, uh, I mean, section, I mean, uh, the chapter two of the constitution also prescribed on how things have to be in terms of uh, national cohesion and unity in this country for balancing, isn't it? Is that not a sensibility? Uh, yeah, I think that we, we tend to um, ascribe too much to these things you call balancing. And uh, the constitution that we operate now, which in my view, I always say is a bad constitution, hasn't helped it because we uh, duplicate and multiply several offices. Okay, and now we have, for instance, we have uh, uh, two substantive presidential officer positions, and we have um, two uh, quasi substantive presidential positions. Okay, people now presume that because there are four, they have to go to you know, you know, different regions. Okay, so we are, we, are not in, 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 we are not helping the uh, unification or unifying um, uh, potentials of a country by uh, creating many offices where there should be one or two, we create so many. And then on the basis of the uh, example of these offices, people now say, okay, they have to go to different areas as a way of unifying us. Have they have they, have they have the unifying effort? They haven't, because we, they now become instruments for polarization, okay, for um, um, pulling apart you know, for basically pandering to sentiments of, you know, tribe, zone, religion, and so on and so forth. So I won't have anything. Uh, if, uh, if I were to, uh, I think that the framers of the constitution, current constitution made a mistake in creating, for instance, two uh, very powerful um, uh, of that positions, Senate and House of Reps. In other claims, where you have a bicameral legislature, the, the one of them is stepped down. Usually the, the leader of, um, of the uh, upper house it's made uh, insignificant. It's made insignificant and, uh, you know, you know uh, not, not really powerless. I can give you instances all over the world. So, the, the, you know, imbuing such of his, so a, lot, a, lot of his, a lot of strength and stamina, you know, and um, uh, power, uh, has given rise to the uh, situation where people request that, or, you know, what request that they should go to uh, different areas. Um, uh, the region must have this, this one must have that. Uh, for me, the creation of so many offices, you know, um, in the legislative houses, okay, hasn't helped the cause for uh, so unification. So we shouldn't have had a deputy, senate, uh, deputy speaker, for example. You should have been a speaker. Well, I, I, this might sound controversial. If if I if I were to be part of the framework of the constitution, I think that we will we will not have any deputies to those positions. Frankly, are you and, also one of those? And, who and, and, that and, and maybe and, two chambers are. And I no. effective. Uh, I think we're given a you know a diversity and uh, plurality. Maybe it's okay, but the, my point is that we shouldn't have too many powerful quasi executive offices. So let me, for yes, instance, based on your argument, yes, honourable, yes, yes. you were saying that mm. well, I mean ethnicity and religion, as much as some of us believe that we shouldn't focus on them, so that it doesn't really affect you know our progress as a people. But again, the, these are considerations that are made. And the framers of the constitution know just how sensitive. When they created the NYC, there are reasons why this happened. And you imagine that 
at some point there could be a possibility that from number one to number six, it will all just be one region of the country or one religion of the country. Would that help this country? My point is um, that having this so many, many having these many offices, you know, um, has only helps in um, intensifying um, the case for regional, you know, um, uh, appeasement. That's my point. Because if you didn't have so many, for instance, you have one or two, and, you know, we have six zones. The six zones can't ask for one or two things at the same time. So having so many offices means that all of them have to say, okay, we have to have, you have to have that. For me, it's, it's absolutely unnecessary. It's unnecessary. And the point I made earlier about, uh, you know, uh, no bicameral legislation in, in, not in, in the entire world having two powerful um, um, presiding officer positions is valid as well. In other places, one would, one would be stepped down. Usually the upper house will not have um, um, a prominent presiding officer position. It's only the lower house that will have that. You, you go to India, um, you have that. So go to the US, you have that. I can get the UK, you have that. So I, I think that we made the, we need to revisit some of our constitutional. Where, where, where uh, is, I mean, there seems to be the opposition coming from, even within the APC, about the manner in which the APC zoned and structured uh, these offices. Why do you think this is happening? Well, um, I think that um, the, the agitation for uh, overriding their party's position uh, might not be unconnected with, you know, um, interests, you know, zonal interests, ethnic interests, religious interests. So people are not looking at um, the entire picture, they're looking at what can benefit they themselves and the, the places where they come from, particularly. And my point is reinforced, my life point is reinforced by what you just said now. If we didn't have these so many offices, perhaps we have all this question for us to have this, you know, have that and, uh, you know, uh, disregard party position. If, if you look at what the manner in which the APC has zoned it, for example, one of the zones um, that feels left out is the North Central region. You look at the Senate presidency, South South, um, the Deputy Senate President, not the West, um, the uh, Speaker, not the West, and the Deputy Speaker, South East. There are two zones there. That, I mean, there is one zone that has two positions. And North Central, do you think that the agitation of members from the North Central is, uh, um, uh, is, is something valid. that the party is valid? Well, I don't think so, because uh, it's not the first time we've had a situation in which um, in one zone uh, was left out of these positions. In the recent past, I, think, I don't think... Um, in the last uh, four years of Buhari's administration, anybody from the Southeast occupied any of those positions. And uh, I remember in the recent past, too, uh, there was a time when the Southeast had both the Senate President and the Deputy Speaker. Okay? That automatically meant that one of the zones had been left out. So it's not a new thing. My point is that it is really fruitless, okay? Making a hue and cry over things like this is totally fruitless. I don't support it. And the well, isn't this the, one of the reasons why people cry foul mm. about the issue of marginalization? Uh, I don't there think so. was a time in the early days of mm. President Buhari's administration that, I mean, the, the, there's a list of the security appointment and those who believe that this, most of these appointments have come from one region of the country. Yeah. You uh, think that, that kind of uh, debate or that kind of uh, questions on appointments or positions is not valid? No, 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 that's a different thing. You know, um, yeah, we, we have to respect, um, um, you know, um, the fact that we are a federal system, a plural federal system. And uh, as Section 14, you know, requires, appointments, appointments will be made con conscious of the fact that we're a diverse and plural, you know, um, secular place. So um, what I'm saying, what I've said earlier, doesn't in any way um, um, suggest what you're, what you're trying to say. Now, the... Precise other positions are elected positions. The ones you're referring to are appointive ones. The president, or whoever is at the center, has a duty to respect the tenets of Section 14 and ensure that his appointments reflect our federal character. But when you're talking about uh, um, elected positions, you know, the presidential positions in the House and the Senate, I don't think that 
you know, um, there should be so much hue, so much force about, you know, who gets elected. I don't think so. The party in power has a duty to give a lead. This is where we are going. This is, this is, this is who we think we, we are putting forward for this. Do okay. you think that the, the manner in which the APC had presented itself and its agenda is acceptable? Well, that's for the party to decide. My point is, that is for party APC members to decide. My point is that um, it's, it's, it is their right. It is the right inherent in their being majority party in legislature. Okay, but so, have they exercised the right in a way that meets the yearnings and aspiration and the real character of our nation? How? How else would you? I'm exercise? asking you. You yeah. are a lawmaker. For, yeah, for me. For I, example, would you be voting along the line of the APC? Uh, well, I think that what the, what I'm going to say next, you know, is already quite what I said before. That because it's their right to decide, you know, um, who to put for, who to nominate as is, you know, the uh, best global practice all over the world. You know, who are they put forward? I, I, will, um, I will vote for the person. Because, you know... Uh, is it because... Let, your, let me, let me your, finish. Your principal... Let, uh, no, 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 no. That, former, former governor, no, he has nothing to do with that. He has nothing to do with that. I just gave you a background to my understanding. Let me tell you, I studied constitutions all over the world. Not in the Nigerian constitution. I, I've been to the U.S. Congress. I've been, I've been in, you know, interacted with U.S. lawmakers. I know the, the practice. I know the rules everywhere. It is not our business to determine for APC who they should put forward. Now, the person who is a speaker or senior president is only a presiding officer. I agree they will um, reasonable influence deciding uh, what gets the floor. Okay, but it's not this, you know uh, the um, the entire you know uh, the entire picture. They cannot, for instance, um, uh, hold an entire house you know uh, captive. And decide everything. So the 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 the, uh, the, the, the our job as lawmakers mm -hmm. is to um, you know get up and focus on what we can do. The who becomes speaker or senior president does not determine your degree of participation, your effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the floor. Yeah, what really house. matters to so, Nigerians yeah. is, uh, I mean, to a large extent, yes. Uh, whether fairness has been done, whether justice has been done, in terms of. Those people who are there are being appointed or being elected, yes, but what matters is what the lawmakers are doing that will affect the lives and the livelihood of the average Nigerians. That's the point. I'd I like us to anchor on this note. That's the point. At that meeting today, mm. was uh, President Tinubu able to convince those who are in attendance today? Yeah, if I um, judge by the response from those there, it was, like I said, it was, his performance was exhilarating. The, and the, the, uh, the feedback right in the spot was fantastic. If I judge by response he got, I would say that he convinced, you know, um, nearly everybody. Who there were no there. opposition. People didn't, there were no dissenting voice in the room. No, no, no. There were no hisses, no heckling. Everything was fantastic. Now, let me just make this point. Um, people have always, you know, have tended to argue that, um, you know, because the constitution says in section 50 that... Uh, the speaker or senior president will be elected from amongst the members. Mm -hmm. That mathematically means that you know the party has no has no the a party, ruling party that has all the numbers on the floor or in the house has no hasn't got responsibility to nominate anyone. That is not correct. I think that's a misconstruction of that section. My view is that um, that simply means that any nobody would be speaker or senior president who is not a member of the house. It doesn't mean that anybody who's a member of the House can contest for those offices. No. To be able, able to contest, one, it must come from the majority party. Secondly, it must be ranking. That section simply means that you, if you're not a member of the House, you can't contest. As you have in the US, where uh, a non member of the Senate is Senate president. And you have in India a non member of um, um, what they call the Raji Sabha, yeah. that's the upper house in India. Mm -hmm. You know me about that house, is uh, the vice president of the country, who is, who is the head of uh, the India right. upper house. So the idea was to ensure, the, basically it's to, it's to say that, look, in Nigeria, for you to be speaker or senior president, you be member of the house, not to say that anybody in that house can contest. Honorable Solomon Bob, a member of the House of Representatives, who also will be returning to the 10th National Assembly, representing River State,
I'm a member of the PDP. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. Thank you. So I appreciate, it. I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Thank you very much. We take a break, everyone. And when we return, we'll be getting yet more perspectives on some of this issue. Senator Shehu Sani will be joining us and it will be weighing in on the issues of the subsidy, the issues of the Bolatinobu presidency and the state of the nation. Stay with me, everyone. We'll be right back. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. I'm now being joined by Senator She Usani, a former federal lawmaker, and uh, can I say a former activist? Because uh, once an activist, always an activist. You have it in you. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. Thank you for having me. Second week of President Tinubu's uh, uh, swearing and being in office, and Nadeko had said to him, congratulations, you are one of those who fought for the return of Nigeria to civilian rule. And now you need to focus on a few things. They highlighted to him what he needs to focus on. But for, from your own point of view, Senator, how would you assess President Tinubu in these two weeks? Um, thank you for having me. Well, first of all, I, I can see that he has started on a good footing. The sense that um, he has proven to be a president, first of all, that is accessible, and um, that also gives a listening ear to people. And from what we can see from a distance, uh, people are trooping to the villa and consulting uh, individuals and groups on what should be the way forward for the country. I think we are starting right for now, yes. For now? Yes. It might be too early. Because I, I remember, no, no, I'm saying for now, yes. and uh, we have to be optimistic. Um, we cannot be pessimistic. And we've got to have the positive mind so that we can help him. He's the one single man that I am of a first, but he cannot do it all. I mean, Nigeria is uh, for everyone anyways. But then, is, if he needs to function well, he needs to get it right. And he needs all the support, isn't it? I mean, although there are those who have political differences and they've gone to court to exercise their differences, but then uh, what would you be saying to a President Tunubu today about what he needs to work out for? Well, like I've said, um, I'm satisfied with the level of consultation which I've seen for now. When I say for now, I mean what will become of the kind of counselling advice and suggestion he gets and how does he apply it in the next, for, next step of his government will determine whether that consultation uh, was useful or not. But the first thing President Tunubu has to do is to get a people that are competent and capable to man the position of authority as he pilot the ship of state to the future. If you, you also need to set an immediate priority of what he needs to address. And as far as Nigeria is concerned, uh, the first is security and the second is economy. And you can also say economy and security. But these two are very important. And taking lessons from what has happened in the last eight years, um, if you talk about economy, you need to get people who are well versed on the economy, are people who have the experience, uh, the ideas, and the vision that will do things differently, and that will help his government succeed and help the country succeed. In the past, we have an economic team, an economic council, and nobody has of them, and nobody knows what they are doing, and nobody can pinpoint this is what they have done. This has to be done differently. And on security, uh, we have seen what has happened to this country in the last 10 years, one decade. Uh, terrorism, banditry, uh, secession, agitation, herdsmen, farmers' crisis, bloodsheds and conflicts in almost all the six geopolitical zones. So now, having uh, security chiefs, security advisors, security herdsmen who have the requisite knowledge, experience, and who was counseling and action will apply in solving our security challenges, I think is very necessary. 
and it has to do with the leadership structure of the architectural structure of Nigeria. Uh, who are going to lead as service chiefs? Who is going to be the national security advisor? Who are going to head all the various security agencies in the country? What will happen to the police? Who is going to head the police? These are very important. The goals he has set for himself can only be achieved if you have people who are first of all experienced and second, they will work in tandem with his own vision. So this, are, this is very He gave a warning though in that area of security and I'm going to come to economy. He said he doesn't want disharmony and he wants coordination. This has been um, a major problem with our security uh, structure in this country where even in the security uh, 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 sector, they will tell you that there's a lack of coordination. They're not sharing intel within themselves. And the kind of persons that, uh, that advises that the person, president listen to is perhaps the closest will be the NSA who advises him on the issue of security. I've heard a lot of people speak about who should he be, what kind of person should he be. And we are hearing some names. What are your views on the kind of character that should be closest to the president in terms of advising him on uh, national security? You see, the security of a nation does not depend on the national security advisor alone. Uh, where you have a security architecture with a leadership of service chiefs, uh, the, the Inspector General of Police, the DG and, and DSS, and all other uh, personnel heading such agencies. And I, and they are very yeah. important. Whoever becomes the National Security Advisors, if you don't also get those ones right, you will still be from where we are. And, and let me correct this. It's not simply about uh, discord and hostility and interagency rivalry that has been the problem in the last, last eight years. And how, as a president, he can learn from the mistakes of the past and use it to guide his own government. Uh, first of all, uh, in the last eight years, almost over $20 billion have been spent on defense and security. And terrorists are still killing people in this country. And secondly, we have had a system where service chiefs uh, were retained in office and their tenure was illegally extended while killings go, uh, went on in the country. So, and the third aspect of it has to do with that there wasn't harmony within the security uh, apparatus themselves. And almost everyone is competing against each other or trying to outdo each other. So, how will his government do things differently will be how it learns from these mistakes and they're doing. First of all, there must be accountability in the way security uh, funds have been spent. It's not simply about a service chief coming with a file to the president and he signed and then you go and collect money. It doesn't function that way. Secondly, uh, each and every person who is appointed to head any agency, security agency, must know that his survival, the continuity, and his relevance in that office is dependent on how much he has performed. That is important. And secondly, and that is where the National Security Advisor comes into being. Uh, a security advisor should first of all be one that has the confidence and loyalty of the president. And the most important one is the competence and the capacity to harmonize the activities of all security agencies agencies with the aim of achieving the goal of ensuring that the security uh, challenges have been addressed. So this is very important. So whoever you are going to appoint as a national security advisor must have the respect of all the agencies. Very important. For example, you can see what happened when General Liu Guso was the national security advisor and how all security agencies report to him. But what became after him and subsequent ones who were appointed seems not to have the confidence and the respect of other agencies. And this is very important. So um, irrespective of other appointments, yeah. the president must be very careful, must, be, must make wise consultation in terms of 
who he appoints as national security. But there are a lot of people who the president will be owing political debt. He's indebted to a lot of people because he didn't win the election all by himself. There are a lot of people who helped him. And there will be those who will want compensation. But there are those who say economy and security are not the kind of position that you will compensate people politically for. That you have to get it right. How pressured would the president be considering these embassies? Those he has to answer to because of what, how they helped him, and the fact that finding the right person to do the job. If you were in his shoes and you have that kind of dilemma around you, what would you be thinking about? Well, um, many people, over ninety percent. Made claims that made claims that they supported uh, Bola Tinubu for patriotic reasons. Uh, the his members, the the northern former northern governors, said for equity and justice and fairness and the principle keeping the principle of restoration of power, we supported Bola Tinubu. The G5 too used the issue of patriotism, unity, peace, and all those kind of platitudes. Uh, they supported Tinubu. And many people, too, um, hide behind patriotism and nationalism to support Tinubu on the ground that he uh, power needs to be rotated and also uh, he has the competence, the capacity to move this country forward. But behind those masks, you will see that there are people who are now waiting for appointment based on the fact that they have planted a seed and they need to harvest and there is nothing wrong with a president who has taken over power, who was supported by some people to get into office, to compensate them in court. But the choice is his, whether he will leave, he will head a government that will spend so much time on appeasing and pleasing entitled persons, or he will do things differently in order to move this country forward. Does he want to be an appeaser and a pleaser? Does he want to be a party man who wants to be a great politician? Or does he want to be a statesman who wants to leave a mark as a president in the last 23 years that has done things differently in this country? And the choice is his. If you pander to people who want to be compensated, Many, thing, many of them have nothing to do other than their fake loyalty and the claim that they have supported him. But in terms of giving them sensitive position to perform, and that will be something different. So to me, if Bola Tinubu, the president of Nigeria, wants to do things differently, and in all this sector, if it's agriculture, look for someone who is competent in agriculture, appoint him as agri minister. If it is transport, if it is health, if it is education, do that for now. For now, the country has spent so much time, we have wasted so much resources in the last two decades compensating politicians with appointments. And this is where it has landed us to. So two things. Whoever is going to take over the economic aspect of Nigeria, either as a team or as an individual, will be the one that is well vaxxed in the field and one that will do things differently. In the aspect of security, we have seen how this country has moved from one security challenges to another. And despite money being pumped in, the solution has still not been found. Terrorists are still killing people. Kidnapping is still going on. And banditry everywhere. Recently, I've had crisis between Thieves and Jukun in some part mm -hmm. of the country. In Benway, Plateau, southern part of Kaduna, the killings are still going on. So how do you solve this problem? And he is only going to be judged by the result that comes from his government and not by people whom he has settled and appointed as politicians. Let him be mindful of the fact that if his government succeeds, the box stop on his table. If it fails, it is still him. Mm. So I mean, compensating yeah. politicians should not be the focus of the, the government now. They, I mean, he is one person who said that uh, he wants to crush the multiple exchange rate that we have. And you are one person who you were in the committee 
the oversight on issues of loans in this country. And we saw, we've seen how much of loans that we have incurred as a people in the past years. Um, and it's going to have a lot of decision to make in the coming days. But there's one decision also that's going to be very critical, which is one thing that Governor of Enugu State, uh, Governor Peter Mba, has asked him today about the release of Anande Kano. There are those who are from the South East also who are asking for unconditional release of Enamde Kano. The governor of Enugu State has been fighting um, the issue of uh, seats at home. If you were President Tunubu, what would you be doing or what would you think that kind of request coming from Governor Umba? Well, first of all, I'm not from the southeastern part of Nigeria. I'm from the northwestern part of Nigeria. And secondly, I am a human rights activist. And thirdly, I have been a prisoner in many prisons. I was also a victim of human rights abuse. And as a prisoner who was once jailed and who have stayed so long in prison, there is no way a person like me will support an open breach of the Constitution, an open violation of fundamental right. A court of jurisdiction in Nigeria has given an order for the release of Namdi Khan. And if we are a law-abiding country, one that has, is committed to rule of law, and one that is being run according to the Constitution of this country, we should respect the law. But that is from the human right and uh, the constitutional side. But from the side of national healing, uh, here we have a president whom has uh, started uh, on a new footing. And one of the problems we face as a country today is the separatist agitation from the southeastern part of Nigeria. And if you go to the background of all those separatists, you will see that there was a time in their history there were people who believed in the indivisibility and unity of Nigeria. Then something must have happened along the way that changed their own vision and say now they want to bolt out. If we don't want to further add fuel to fire, it's important that those segment of people in the southeastern part of Nigeria that believes in the unity of this country, we shouldn't be disappointed. Uh, a plea was made by governors of a region, and they are offering guarantee. There is no reason why the government should not accede to it. To me, President Bola Tunubu being one that has come from the trenches, even though when we are in jail, he was in exile, I believe that he should leave a footprint, one of the most important one, is strengthen the unity of this country. Because we can't pretend that we don't have a problem. A marginalization and alienation of people of the southeastern part of Nigeria and their stigmatization because of the civil war is a reality. And if we have a president here who wants to do this differently, he should listen to them. Mm. If you have a few who believe that they should move out of Nigeria, and a many who believes in remaining within Nigeria, then we should be able to win the hearts of those who believe in secession back to, to those who believe in the unity of this country. And we shouldn't shy away from it. Uh, Namde Kanu was also someone who was like Ken Saroyua and other ones who fought in the past. And we shouldn't say that we should simply use law and solve all problems. All right. Unity, consensus, consultation is very important. I think we should anchor on the politics of the National Assembly. You've been there, you know uh, how the leadership politics is, you, I mean, usually is. Uh, what is going on an intervention of President Tinubu? What is your view and how do you see this thing panning out? Well, um, if you go back to 2015, one of the mistakes President Buhari, Buhari made was that he never consulted the senators elect when it comes to the issue of his candidate. He simply want Lawan to be made the Senate president and without due consultation. You see, as a president of the country, you have a lot of leverage. There's no way a president will invite senators elect, many of whom are just coming for the first time, 
and say, this is the person I want to work with and I need your support. I want to please to support him. I mean, 99% of them will accede to it. But if you simply go into a room and decide that out of 109 people, there is one person who you believe will be loyal to you and others will not be, and there is one person who you believe in and you are also doubting the sincerity, the loyalty, and the uh, solidarity of others, uh, you are going to have a problem. So I, I've seen what has happened now. Tunubu being a former senator, and he was also part of those in 2015 when Saraki and, uh, and uh, Lawan had issues. He was also part of the cycle. So I, I thought that by now, the first thing he needed to do, knowing that his party has the majority, is to first of all go into a room with members of his party, talk to Uju Uzokalu, talk to Yari, talk to them and say, this is the person I want you to support. They will agree with him. But that was not done. The danger, what is happening in National Assembly now is that there are basically two candidates, Akpabio and Yari. Akpabio is the anointed of the president, while Yari is a rebel a leader. Now, I have no doubt, from now to Monday, if there is no serious consultation and appeasement and host trading, it may go the wrong way of the president. And one thing I know very well is that if they go to the floor without, the APC goes to the floor without putting his house in order, then the 2015 scenario will enact itself, especially if there is a secret voting. If there is an open voting and the president is sitting down to watch every senator where he votes, uh, Apavio will win. But if it's going to be a secret ballot where nobody knows where anybody vi mm. votes, certainly it's going to be Yari. Mm. So we should be expecting some drama. It's going to be... More activities between now and the weekend and uh, maybe mon between Monday and Wednesday we'll be, we should be expecting some drama. Certainly. And the show with is always uh, good to glean from your wisdom and your knowledge. Thank you so much for the insight tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you so much indeed. But that's our show for today, everyone. Many thanks indeed for watching. I'm sure I'll see you tomorrow again at 7 p.m. Bye for now, everyone.